How have the Puritans in particular shaped your life and ministry? I know, Dr. MacArthur, I've heard you talk through the years about Thomas Watson and Stephen Charnock. Dr. Piper, even in your message last night, you talked about John Owen, John Howe, and of course the American Puritan, Jonathan Edwards. So how have these faithful figures from church history, how have they impacted you? Well, if you're gonna, if you're gonna include Jonathan Edwards with the Puritans, the answer is immeasurably. Um, nobody outside the Bible that I am aware of has had a greater impact on me than Jonathan Edwards. And I'll just mention three steps in that. I was in a classroom, fall of 1968. Dan Fuller was speaking clearly, precisely, and rationally about God. The class was full of psych students who didn't like this. So they were raising their hands. Why are you so rational? Why don't you get more practical and emotional? And Dr. Fuller said, why can't we be like Jonathan Edwards, who could be writing a philosophical treatise that would bend the minds of the greatest intellects and break into a paragraph that would thrill your grandmother's godly soul. And I was out of my chair. I I was just on my way to the library. I've only heard Jonathan Edwards mentioned in one context, sinners in hand in the name of God. I don't have any idea that he had said anything like that. And the book I found was The End for Which God Created the World. That book changed the world for me. It just turned everything upside down because the point was God uh, is very God-centered and does everything he does for the glory of God. I had learned I'm supposed to do everything for the glory of God. I didn't know God did everything for the glory of God, and my world changed. So that was step number one. Step number two was the freedom of the will. There is no greater book on the planet about the freedom of the will, which doesn't exist, (laughs) than Jonathan Edwards. Doesn't exist with this definition, and let us be precise. We are Puritans. We serve a precise God. Ultimate human self-determination is what does not exist. And that's what most people mean by freedom of the will, though they don't say it to themselves. And that book settled that issue for me. I mean, it was just phenomenal. David Wells says it is, it is a watershed book. It's like if you read that book, you come down one way or the other, and the argument is over. And third, I'm sitting in a rocking chair in Munich, Germany, every Sunday night. There are no services Sunday night, and I'm reading for months, just a few pages at a time, The Religious Affections by Jonathan Edwards, and my soul is being shredded, shredded, and my, which interestingly enough has been one of my responses to the people who say he was a slaveholder, Piper. He was a slaveholder. And I say, I didn't know that for the first 20 years that I read him, and now I've known it for a long time. I've grieved over it, I've struggled with it, and, and one of my responses, you can read my longer response at Desiring God, um, is I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't begin to countenance that. I, I don't know what kind of loopholes, or, I don't know, I don't know what that was like, but this I know, nobody has broken me, humbled me, laid me low, and undisposed me to racism like Jonathan Edwards. I can't not say it. I can't not believe it. That's just reality. I can't not say that reality, that reading the religious affections, especially the chapter on evangelical humiliation. So those three books, those three stages uh, would be my answer to the question, how has that Latter-day Puritan affected me? It's totally. I think my first... um really serious impact from the Puritans was uh, Charnock, The Existence and Attributes of God. I, I, I couldn't even comprehend that you could say that much about God. 
That's, uh, that's how limited I was. Yeah. Um, I thought, you know, if you read the Knowledge of the Holy, which is about that thick, you got it. This was, this was a revolution. And I think um, the, the, the Puritans had the ability, and I'll mention this probably later in my little talk, but the, the Puritans had the ability to go on and on and on and on and on and on and never really escape the confines of a text. It's not like they were springboarding. Mm -hmm. It was there. It was in there. And that, that's, that's what I saw. And all I wanted was the text, the text, the text. I just want to know what it means and what it says. And, and I found they were, they exhausted me mm -hmm. with the, the possibilities and intricacies and depths. And I, I discovered that in Charnock. Um, I mean, there are many things I liked about them. Um, I remember flying from Peru one night reading Thomas Watson on the Beatitudes and um, reading the Body of Divinity and certain other things. But I think it was my exposure to Charnock that showed me what minimal things I really understood about God mm -hmm. and opened up just vast um, realities to me. Um, you know, at the time, I had been a little bit influenced by a preaching style that was taught at Dallas Seminary, where you're not allowed to leave the text. If you read Haddon Robinson, you're sort of confined <laughs> to the text, and you find a main point, and you find the subpoints, and you connect, and you don't go anywhere else. And I, I couldn't do that, because I, I, everything I read in a text made me think of something else in the text, analogia scriptura. I was bouncing all over the place. And this is, what, this is what my heart was telling me, and I think Stephen Chernock legitimized my heart's desire to take what was there and to find every possible thing in Scripture that elucidated or yeah. illustrated it. Right. Yeah. 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 I think it's impossible to stay at the text. Impossible. Right. Not, it's not a choice. Because you have to know an author's larger worldview to understand any sentence. And there aren't enough sentences within a paragraph to do that. Right. You, you cannot take the text, practice hospitality, and preach a Christian sermon on it from the text. You can't. You have to go elsewhere to find <clears throat> out what should motivate Christian hospitality. What's the goal of Christian hospitality? What's the manner of Christian hospitality? How does Christian hospitality relate to the cross? How does it relate to heaven? How does it relate to hell? You can't preach that way. Don't kid yourself. So whatever they were doing at that seminary, <laughs> it's impossible. You have to know other realities that an author has in his head besides the sentence he just spoke or you cannot understand the sentence. And, and I think what, what drives it for me, and I know it does for you, because I can hear it in your preaching, you're not done with that test, text until you're done asking questions of that text. Right. You just, what about that? Well, if, the, if that's the case, then what about this? Well, how does that connect with this? Well, if you say that, then what about this text over here that seems to say something different? So for me, the preparation of a sermon is to run myself through that text until I've run out of questions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. Which and the, they're not all answered in that text. Right. Which inevitably leads, and we, I think we talked about this earlier, and it would be a good thing to say in regard to Puritans, leads to um, doctrinal formulations Absolutely. about what's in that text instead of just saying the words of the text, but rather to say, now, how does that fit in here and here and here right. of reality about God and Christ and faith and obedience? How does it work? And that leads you to doctrines. And so I, I think what, what you've modeled and, and I think increasingly well over the years and what I've tried to do, and, and I think 
what Puritans did masterfully was you preach textually and doctrinally. Yes. You're, after five years or so, your people should have some idea what your theology is. Unlike the denominational official who told me when I was about to preach on Romans 9, and, and I was worried at the time about whether it would blow the church up, he said, oh, I think it's possible to preach on Romans 9 so that the people don't know what you think. <laughs> he said that. That's a curse on the church. So don't, let, let them know what you think about depravity when you've got a text on sin. I mean, it, it, people, people don't have any idea what's in your head. And they have little teeny views of their own depravity. They don't know what, what, they, what they're talking about. And you, you've got to take the text and you've got to draw out those connections so that it, it gets really serious and weighty and they have some doctrinal sense of, of the truth that's behind the text. 